lot of us grew up believing it ain't the moment we can lose it all at the drop of a hat god might turn his back to come up here front and center, please. Ken CEO's front and center. Okay, all right. If, uh, I just need you to know how cruel these people are. <laughs> they made me keep a secret for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And some of you I heard discovering this secret this morning. The first yell was Tanya, and I thought it was Maz. It was so loud. And the second yell was Maz, and I thought it was Maz. It was so loud. If you haven't read their shirt, we are celebrating the joyful life. I think we have a, how many more weeks? 26 more weeks? Some, something like that. Too many, but they have just completed the first trimester. And by the way, it has been brutal on poor Ophelia. She has been sick on sick on sick. And so she's never showed it, and she never showed that she is expecting this little one, but today, I want, Matt, what do you want to say to us, man? <laughs> we are so excited, would you give them a big I'll let you go back, but this is how it's supposed to be done, right? This is a couple who set their mind and heart on God first. God brought them together. They're going to raise their child in the church. It is so encouraging to see that take place this morning. We should just be done and go home today. What do you think? Right there? No, I got something I want to say to you guys. Greet one another. Say hi. Hug a neck. And uh, be appreciative that you've got other folks here today.
people who had a trip to Branson. We had ladies who went to the, the women's retreat down at Falls Creek over Friday and Saturday. We had prom. We had prom. I, I almost couldn't get that out of my mouth. At prom. We had prom. We had a Falls Creek meeting. We had all kinds of stuff going on. This has been a full week. First and then days. everybody worked on top of that. It birthdays. Is a, what's that? Birthdays. We had birth, birthdays. We got Somebody turned 18 and somebody turned 13 in my house. So we had two birthdays and two surprise birthday parties. So we had four birthdays for them this week. Some of you had hard weeks. You had good weeks. But we are glad to be starting the next week together. Important announcement coming up on Easter Sunday. When is Easter Sunday, by the way? Next week. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. So... For those of you who are like most everyone else in here and you only listen to announcements that are for the next week because you're praying God is going to return before the week after that anyway. So this is for you people. Next Sunday, 630 at this location. Can you see it from where you're at? No, you can't. So you get your own copy or you go to Facebook because some people still use Facebook, I understand. Uh, Retha will post it on Facebook. This is at the Cancio property, or one of the Cancio properties in uh, the neighborhood up here north and east of us, uh, near the Scheidler uh, Elementary School, and it's going to be off of 26th and, 26th and Central. Do I have that right? Yeah, 26th and Central. Um, I got, in, I love kind of crazy stuff, and this past week I got to tell you this because this is pretty fun. Uh, I'm in Home Depot, young man walks up to me, he said, Coach Brewster, do you remember me? I, I've coached like 63,000 people in the past 22 years. I don't have any idea who this guy is. I said, man, you look familiar, which is what I always say even when they don't. What is your name? And he said, my name is 
Freddie Villanueva. And I went, boom, and the memory came flushing back, uh, flooding back in my head. I remember Freddie graffitiing the building at Capitol Hill, me catching him in the act of spray painting the building. So he was one of my soccer players. He was, he was a hot mess in high school. He now works in water quality control at Tinker. He's married, has two kids that go to Westmore High School. He's doing great, involved in a local church. But at some point in the conversation, he's saying, hey, you're still doing church, right? I said, yeah. He goes, do you ever do like outside events or revivals? And it's like, yeah, <coughs> sometimes we do stuff. He goes, well, I've got a tent. And it's a 30 by 50 tent, a big kind of like circus type tent. like. And he is giving it to us. We're going to set it up for the very first time so that even if Easter Sunday is pouring down rain like it does about two-thirds of the time, we're going to have a giant tent set up on the Cancio property next week. So I'm very excited about that. It also will be available if you need to have an outdoor event that needs a 30 by 50 tent in your backyard. I don't know. It might fit over the pool. What do you think? It would cover most of your house, I think. This is a gigantic tent. So I'm excited about this next week. <laughs> 6.30 in the morning at this location, uh, or you can Google Earth it yourself. And after that, we're either going to eat breakfast together there or come back here. We haven't fully determined that, but breakfast follows. Friday night, there's going to be a canvassing and inviting the 100 neighbors that are in an eight, is it eight blocks? Eight blocks around this area, the area that the Cancio family is specifically going in to to evangelize, to bring the kingdom to, for those that don't know the Lord. And we're going to pass out flyers if you're available Friday night to go with Cancios to this eight-block area. There are 100 homes. They've got 100 flyers. And we could do it in like an hour and a half if everybody showed up. So more details to follow? Uh, Facebook post. Facebook post. All right. So any announcements about next Sunday again? Because sometimes at the end of the service, nobody's listening anymore. I've noticed that. All right. Let's continue singing. And I may bring it up again in a minute.
like a little worse. Like surely at some point it'll just pass, but it didn't. I was watching the weather. It just sort of ground over us and the, and the radar would renew and it was just circling over us. And then it just kept going. I'm thinking, good grief, it will never end. But this morning, what do we see? Beautiful sun coming out, right? Birds are acting like nothing's going on. They're just eating all the worms that are washed out now. The dogs are running around in our yard. And I was reminded that sometimes our weeks are like yesterday. It is just, it grinds us down and it looks bleak and stormy and dreary. But the sun is going to come back out. There will be a better day. And it was so bright and beautiful this morning. This had to remind you of that. If you didn't get out and see the sun today, you need to be out sometime today. Because you had enough of that dreary weather yesterday. God reminds us that he brings us joy in the morning. That he brings us happiness after sorrow. That he renews beauty from ashes. This is our God, right? Aren't you glad you're here today? I'm so glad you're here today. Let's sing. They say sometimes you win some. Sometimes you lose some.
it is well with my soul. Amen? Amen. spirits that are here today, but that you energize our minds to hear what you would have us hear. I know you can pull that off, Father. Thank you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen. I was making notes to a group of folks in this part of the room that they seem to be unaware that young people don't go to church very often anymore. And in fact, as I look out across this group, the average age of this group, um, those of us 50 and older notwithstanding, is pretty young. Wife, you are not anywhere near 50. I just want you to know. Mikey, you're not anywhere near 50 either. <laughs> for a totally different reason. It is so good to be here with you, all different shapes and sizes and colors and states of mind. But I want us to draw together into our attention on the word today. Are you with me? I think that if Delicia and Maz and I, who else was at prom last night? And Lily, if we can do it this morning, all y'all can do it. I'm just saying. All right? 
I bailed out before Lily did. Lily bailed out before Miss Moz did. I bailed out before you, Miss Miss Moz bailed out before Delicia did. And then Christy got up in the middle of the night to go pick up Delicia. So Delicia, you're the champion. You've had the least amount of sleep probably in this whole group. And she's got prom hair and she just don't care today. Look at that, it's sticking out everywhere. I'm so glad you are here. And I want us to not waste our time just listening to me so you've got to engage. This is, as I've acknowledged, probably the least effective way of teaching. So if I'm not doing a good job teaching, you have to be a much more effective learner today. So crank up your learning. You have to be a, a scholar today. Have your word open and be ready to listen. Last week we studied a church called Thyatira. What a weird name. And we, we spoke under the topic of the church being used as intended. And in the discussion, I think, I'm hopeful, that we were reminded of the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is not solely to focus on those who are present in the church. It is to bring glory to God. By the way, that's why the whole universe was invented. That black hole that somebody took a picture of this week, that's pretty exciting. Uh, science nerds, did anybody hear about that black hole this week? So you're like me, I was like, dude, that's, since Disney made a movie called The Black Hole, we've been wondering what a black hole would really look like, and we were pretty sure it wasn't Disney's version, and when you looked at it, it was like the eye of Sauron. It was this big black hole with like fire around it, and we're seeing it from what, 50 million years ago? Is that what they said, that this is light that's traveled 50 million years to get to us? So it's like an old picture. We don't even know what it looks like now, but it's the largest black hole they could aim anything at, and they aimed virtually all of the telescopes in the world toward this black hole that was created 50 million years ago to bring glory to God. Think about that. Amen. To bring glory to God. And we were placed on the earth sometime probably after that black hole sprung into existence at the word of our God. And we are in the same manner to bring glory to our God. And I believe that while God could have chosen to put other life on other planets, I think he's just crazy extravagant and created an entire universe and only placed one little tiny minuscule planet in that universe that sustains the life that he placed on it called humans and that he put us here to bring glory to him. You are far more significant than you think you might be on a given day. You are created in the image of God. The image of God. And then he said, all of you that are created in my image, I need you to get together because you have central purposes in all of creation. One is to know me. And then because I have given my most precious creation free will, you are to make me known to other people as well. And I'll call this my bride, the church of Jesus Christ, my precious bride. God is monogamous. He has one bride, his church. And we celebrate our intended purpose to bring glory to God through the knowing of our God and the making of him known. So when you put it like that, church has a pretty important role to play. Used as intended. The church in Thyatira had to be reminded of that. To bring glory to God. Through the salvation of the lost and the maturing of the followers of Christ. So that in due time... We will be fully restored to our God. Our sin will be erased and we will abide with him forever in his perfection. We see this vision lived out in the missional lives of Christians who really believe that there is a God and that there really is a church that is called to seek God and obey the tendencies now of our new natures in Christ by living this out in a daily way. In other words, we wake up every single morning 
challenged in the same way that every other human being is, but we are redeemed in a different way than human beings who've not been redeemed are. In fact, they haven't been redeemed. And we are awakened and born into a brand new life. We live in a tendency now to want to please our God, the one who has rescued us. I mentioned my tractor last week. You guys remember my tractor and my tiller? I told you that I had repaired my tractor. I had tuned my tractor. I had studied the mechanism of a previously broken tiller and repaired it. And I changed the fluids in it and I tightened all of its nuts and bolts and I lubricated all the parts that were supposed to be moving freely and I attached it to my tractor and then I parked it in my shop. Because I couldn't do anything with it. The ground was too wet. I, I went out and tried to use it and it didn't do what it was supposed to because the ground was too wet. I parked it in my shop and until my tractor and that tiller could find their purpose in being used for what they were intended. They were just an elaborate pile of spare parts. But I'm proud to tell you, I got it out this week and I tilled some ground. Aren't you excited about that? I'm excited about that. Because later this year, there's going to be watermelons and cantaloupes and corn and beans and Brussels sprouts and probably some things you don't like and some things you do like. And we love to share them with our family. My tractor our church family, my tractor has prepared the ground and done what it's supposed to so we can make it fruitful and enjoy what God has given us. That's what the church is supposed to do. We have been created and intended for a purpose that doesn't include cloistering together away from the world and entertaining one another. We are a utility vehicle to take the gospel to a lost world. To love on those around us that don't know why we would love on them. Because Christ has first loved us. It was really fulfilling to see my tractor work. I'm just such a nerd, right? I get on that thing and to watch that ground get powdered up and those weeds get pulverized and air to go into the soil. And I can see where I've amended that soil. I was just so pleased to see my tractor do what it was intended to do. Can you imagine how excited God is when he sees the church do what it's supposed to do. How the angels rejoice when this organization is doing what God intended it to do. I believe that it must bring joy to the heart of God because he created us for that. I want to look at the three final churches in Revelation chapter 3 today. We're going to think about the messages that we receive from each of these three today. I'm going to kind of be flying because it's the last three of seven. We've got a lot to get in because I really, really can't wait to speak about the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ next week. And I'm going to get to that next week. But for this week, I want us to continue to take the example of these churches. That the churches are simply enough for this world. There is nothing more that is needed than Jesus Christ manifesting salvation through those that he has saved. The transformed church is enough for the world. In Revelation 3, we see the church at Sardis addressed. And this is what John the Revelator wrote down when the angel of the Lord, also known as Jesus Christ, said to him the following, To the angel of the church at Sardis write, These are the words... Of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I want to stop right there. Bible theologians, doctrinal people. What are the seven spirits of God? I'm going to take a drink of water while you figure that out. What are the seven spirits of God? A lot of no eye contact going on right now. Anybody got any idea? Well, even if you were looking in your study Bible, you would probably not still have much of an idea. There are several things that it could be. Several things that it could be. The Bible hasn't been explicit on telling us what these seven spirits of God are. But what do we know about the number seven, for example? Completeness, Completeness right? It is the number of God. Seven, seven, seven. Perfection in completion. Three sevens would be God's number, Right? incompleteness or almost complete, which is not complete, is six. Three sixes is perfectly imperfect. The number of the beast we see 
in Revelation, right? So 777, God's number, would be one of the ways we understand the seven to be a, an indication of the perfection of the Spirit. What is the only Spirit we know to be perfect? The Holy Spirit, right? It's likely this is speaking of the Holy Spirit. We see some other places in the Old Testament and, I think, Isaiah, and then in Revelation that indicate there are characteristics of God that are listed in Isaiah. There are seven characteristics of God, but we don't really know. But what I really know is that God knows what this means, and he indicates that the seven spirits of God are held by him and the seven stars. We do know a little bit about the seven stars. What are those? The pastors, right? The pastors. And what were the lampstands we heard earlier? The churches. I know your deeds. Anybody ever been in that spot? Where somebody says, I know what you did. And you are full of dread because they might actually know what you did. I have an evil trick I play on high school students sometimes where I tell them I know what they did, but I don't really know what they did, but I think they've done something. And they sit there and begin to squirm, and many times they will confess something I had no idea that they had done because I just tell them I know what they did. Or I know what they did here, but I didn't know the other things they told me they did, right? God knows what we did. He knows what we do, and he knows what we're going to do. And speaking to the church, he says, I know your deeds, which are the actions which follow what people say they believe. You see, we can say we believe things, but if we don't do things, it's unlikely that we really believe things. I'm a soccer player. You are. Where do you practice? I don't practice. Really? No, I just play soccer. Well, you're not much of a soccer player. I'm a writer. Well, how do you work on your craft? Oh, I don't. I, I can just write good. Really? Really? I know your deeds. The deeds are what flow out of your actual beliefs. When I say I'm a soccer player, I mean I like to watch soccer. I don't mean that playing part. When I say I'm a Christian, I mean I like some of those things that Christians stand for. I don't really want to do some of those things. But Jesus speaking to the church, as Sardis said, I know your deeds. You have a rep. Listen to this. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. That's a harsh message, is it not? You have a reputation for being alive. I think that's one of those where he set them up. I know your deeds in a church that has a reputation for being alive is probably beginning to nod its head. Jesus knows our deeds. He's heard about us. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. That is a sobering and direct allegation against this church. Wake up, exclamation point. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. There is a plant that we have in one of the northern entryways of our school. It's a plant we rescued from the mall when they closed it down. It was a ficus or something, a big, giant mall plant. And we rescued it pretty well too late. And then some people being helpful watered it too much. And the remaining leaves on this tree just fell off, like overnight one time. Not like one, and I just say dropped, all of them. But well, this is a done plant. We're done with this one. But one of my principals, Ms. Harper, said, I think it'll be okay. I said, I don't think it's going to be okay. She said, I think it'll be okay. I don't think it's going to be okay. She said, let me roll it down here where it can get some light, and we will see what happens. And it sat there with no leaves on it for months and months and months. I went by it the other day, and part of it has come back to life. It's starting to grow green leaves again. Something remained in that that with the proper nurturing could now come back to life. Some of us are like that in our spiritual lives. We're languishing. We have not nourished what God placed in us. And it is dying. But God in his grace says, wake up. It's not too late. 
take that tiny ember, that little spark of faith you still have, and fuel it, feed it, and it will come back to life. He said, it's not too late for you. Remember, oh, excuse me, for I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come for you. That would be terrifying to hear that message. That would be terrifying to hear that message. As a head of a household, to go back and speak to my wife and children after hearing that message would be a rough day. So, Dad, what did he mean when he said, Jesus said, our church is known for being alive but is really dead? What did he mean when he said, wake up? What did he mean when he said, take what is still alive and, and, and work with it, bring it back before it's too late? What did he mean when he said, I will come like a thief? Maybe it's hyperbole. Maybe it's exaggeration. Maybe it's just symbolic speech. Or maybe this is the way the heart of God works, not only within the individual believer, but within the church as well. But he says, there are some in Sardis. I like this. A few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. For those of you with a less delicate translation, it means poop your drawers is what it means. For those of you who have not soiled your clothes with the fecal matter of sin, there are some people who have still not given over to the corruption of their society. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whew. Can you imagine? If this is factual, and I believe it is, and it is predicting an actual event that will occur, and I believe it does, I think we may have the... The, the opportunity to stand in the presence of God and hear those people right there named by name in front of God and his angels as people who wore white, who did not soil their clothes even when those around them were doing such terrible things in the name of their God. Wake up. And wear white. In fact, if you read the rest of Revelation, you see this idea that you should wake up and wear white all throughout the book of Revelation. That those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and live lives that affirm that redemption will be held up before their God. There were people in the church at Sardis who are those people. To the church at Philadelphia. You remember the church at Smyrna? that we read about the, a few weeks ago. What do you remember about the church in Smyrna? You can look. A lot of long pauses today. They persecuted. They suffered, but what? They persevered. What else? They remained faithful. What else? They were poor in, in money, but they were rich in the spirit. In fact, God said, you're not poor. You're rich. They got the victor's crown. They got the victor's crown. Remember this, right? This was that group. If I'm one of the churches, I want to be Smyrna, right? There wasn't a but. There wasn't a but. There, was, there wasn't a fearsome presentation of who was writing about them, like one with fire in his eyes or a two-edged sword in his mouth, Right? The church at Sardis was one who was found faithful and affirmed even in their suffering that God would recognize that and reward them. Let's read about the church in Philadelphia and see about them. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, 
no one can shut. And when he shuts, no one can open. I just love the strength that is expressed by God's affirmation of who he is when he says that. God creatively brags on himself whenever he speaks of himself. Interesting to see God use human language to be able to convey inhuman ideas, things that we can't even fathom to us. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. I love it when the bully gets his due. The one who uses their strength to oppress someone else. We love it when the underdog is championed by one who is righteous. This is the ultimate picture of that. The church has been oppressed, but they've maintained their fidelity to God. They have not had strength, but even in their weakness, they have been true to the Father. And Jesus said, I have opened up a door for you. Oh, and by the way, all of those fools in the purest biblical sense, all of those fools who belong to the synagogue of Satan, those who say they are Jews, God's chosen people, but are not, will one day be forced to bow before you. you know, don't we just want God to reach down a little bit sooner sometimes and correct some stuff? To fix some things, to right some wrongs, to to affirm that the lies we live in following him are the right lies, but trust me, he will make it all right someday. He will affirm those who have maintained their fidelity to him. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I love the fact that God loves us each especially. And in this instance, he has identified a church in their weakness and they've undergone oppression but have maintained their fidelity. And he said, I've got something special for you. That even while the rest of the world is being tested, I will preserve you from this testing. What a beautiful gift from God. He goes on to say, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will ever take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Man, it kind of sounds like Jesus has some favorites in Philadelphia. Like, they're getting special treatment in Philadelphia. Makes me kind of want to move to, not our Philadelphia, but the original Philadelphia. Our Philadelphia is not quite probably what they're talking about in this case. I'm kind of jealous of these people when I read what Jesus said about them, that he is going to set them as pillars in the temple of God and they will never leave it. They will have the name of the new Jerusalem written on them. And in fact, Jesus' new name written on them. That is a stamp of identity that is indelible. If you want to get a tattoo, that's the one you want right there. That is the permanent affirmation to whom you belong. The church in Philadelphia was faithful. Verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea writes, these are the words of the amen. Cool. What does that mean? The end. So be it. The affirmation that it will be so. I hope stuff happens sometimes. I try to make some things happen sometimes. I fall radically short nearly all the time. God just says it and it happens. He is the amen. If God says it, it is so. He spoke 
the universe into existence. Not because he needed words, right? But just so we could understand that it was by his impulse of will that all things were created. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. Wow, we didn't even get anything positive out of this church. He launched right into his indictment of them. They are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. I often tell students they're not even good at being bad. You're bad at being bad. You're not even proficient at doing the wrong thing. I wish you were at least good at being bad. I could have some sort of grudging respect for your prowess in that area, but you're bad at being bad. How about you just try to be good at being good and do the right things? Understand that. Jesus said, and I don't even think it was tongue-in-cheek, that it is more annoying to be riding the fence, to be lukewarm, to be passive, to be weak and deluded, tossed about by everything around us than it is to stand for something, even if it's the wrong thing. Listen to how God deals with lukewarm. Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Some translations say vomit you out. But you say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched and pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Have you ever felt that way when you see a celebrity splattered all over social media? Carefully painted up, carefully attired, carefully lit with all the right angles presented and think how sad their life must be. They find all of their value in an Instagram. Think about that. In an Instagram. Something that is so true, right? So true in its name and in its nature that people miss the irony. It literally is a false image that disappears like a vapor. And people are affirmed when others look at this false image that will disappear like a vapor and like it and send it on and say, that is me. What a tragedy it is to be celebrity. I was reading about an Oklahoma native son, a guy named Blake Griffin, who grew up not too far from here, in fact. Played a little basketball. And Blake was different in high school, it seemed, than he is now in real life. And it's just such a tragedy to see how he has affirmed who he is to the world. And he happened to go to a Christian school where I know he was taught the truth of God. And yet he hasn't adopted the truth of God. He thinks he's got it made. He's, what, 6'10"? He can jump out of the gym. He sells Kias. He has two kids. He's not with them or his girlfriend, former girlfriend anymore, but now he's got a new ball club. He's happy to be playing with Detroit. Is that where he's at now? Blake Griffin thinks he has it made. I literally could put his name or 10,000 other celebrities of the moment's names in this spot. You think you're rich, but you are wretched, naked, pitiful, Blind, But even in that, our God is a God of grace and wants to redeem folks like that. The disgusting life that a, a rapper and artist named Cardi B not only came out of, but now promotes as a way of living is one that God wants to redeem her from. A beautiful human being on the inside, no matter what is being expressed, on the outside is available if the grace of God is allowed to wash her of her sins just like he washes us of ours. 
And we could go on and on. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. How cool would it be if genuine spiritual revival swept Hollywood in the United States? None of us believe that will happen. I can tell from our faces now. But if our God can redeem any of us, he can redeem all of them. What would it be like if all that talent and opportunity now turned to praising God with what they have? He says, buy that kind of gold from me. Take that kind of affirmation from me. Receive that kind of healing from me and you will be who I intended you to be. So even to the church in Laodicea, he says that. To those, in verse 19, I love, I rebuke, and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus says this is available to all who will receive what I am offering. Just like I was declared victor over sin and death and then was awarded my seat beside the father at the throne, I will award your seat beside me with the Father at the throne. To him who has ears, let them what? Hear. But to hear what the Spirit says to churches. Each of the churches in Revelation are addressed by God himself. We cannot whitewash this or dilute this. We have to think about this. What what actually came from God, he knows them intimately, better than they know themselves. And so, because he is God, he speaks with power, and he speaks with authority, and he speaks with perfection. I remember watching um, a video of one of my performances in a musical while I was in college. You should never do that. Ever. Ever. Those of you that have listened to your voice on a recording or watched the video will often be destroyed by the experience because you're thinking, oh my gosh. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. And I was, so, I was mortified. I watched this video in the middle of the run of a, of a musical called Big River. And I was one of the leads. And so I was watching the video. And I want to be candid with you because in my mind, I thought I was pretty good. People bought tickets. We sold out 17 shows. I got the lead. I must have been pretty good. I watched it and realized, oh, my gosh. They just didn't have anybody else that could play an immature 16-year-old. It was me. It was typecasting. I am Huckleberry Finn. I just can't sing like I need to. And I was just devastated by this. I felt exposed when I saw this. I felt embarrassed when I saw this. Our truth is not true most of the time. We can't be trusted with what we think about ourselves. Good or bad. You're wrong. But God can always be trusted with what he thinks about you. Think about that. The things that he leveled on these churches, the affirmations and the indictments were perfectly merited. At Ephesus... God identifies himself as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold lampstands. In Smyrna, he said, I am the first and the last, the one who died and came to life again. In Pergamum, he showed up with a sharp two-edged sword of the word of God. In Thyatira, he declared that he is the son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished 
bronze to the church in Sardis. He says, I hold the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. In Philadelphia, he's the God who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. That's the redemption of all people who would follow God in obedience to Jesus Christ. And to Laodicea, these are the words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. This is the Jesus who redeems us. Think about the power of these letters. And the churches in Revelation are like the rest of us, both individually and corporately. They and we exhibit the same types of tendencies. And I want to go through what I think are some broad strokes of the things we've got to be careful about. Because the things that were revealed to these churches are not merely an academic exercise that we can read and go, hmm, that's interesting. They are to point out the things that we need to be aware of in our own lives and in our church. Those churches were, first of all, distracted. They were distracted by the wealth and comfort of their lives, by the philosophies and learnings of those around him. They were distracted oftentimes by the troubles and even the victories of the day. There are many things in our lives that distract us from being in relationship with God. They were divided in these churches, oftentimes by petty differences, by infighting and power struggles, but ultimately by human pride. They were upset by semantics and non-essentials. They were divided by the drive to create many kingdoms instead of seeking the unity of the church to bring glory to the one God alone. We see this in the one million different types of denominations and churches and factions that have split and splintered the one true church for the past 2,000 years. By the way, there will be a day when our God sweeps up all of these shards and rebuilds the church as it is intended to be. We are distracted, divided, and we are often dismayed, sometimes by the poverty and oppression that we face, but also by the poverty and oppression that we bring on ourselves by our own faithlessness. We are dismayed sometimes by the loss of those around us and the loss of our health and the loss of our jobs, and we are weakened by the rejection of so many. Sometimes our churches are deluded by the hollow philosophies that others will preach, whether they are a gospel of prosperity or a gospel of permissiveness. All of these things are attractive to us as they were to some of the churches that are noted in Revelation, and they allowed sexual promiscuity and the fracturing of the family unit as important. They allowed those who would be drawn to skin-deep beauty and the sweet lies that would come from someone like that Jezebel that was mentioned to sway them from the pure truth of their Savior. Distracted, divided, dismayed, deluded, but ultimately deceived. Deceived by those who actively, actively seek to follow the father of lies, those that made up the synagogue of Satan that were mentioned in at least two of those churches, those who will never cease to, destroy, to try to destroy what God has built. I read an article by Nick Ripkin today in Hour One that spoke of the oppression in the Iranian church. And wherever there is Jesus, Jesus there will be a Judas as well. Anytime Christ shows up, there will be those that try to destroy the redemption made available to the families and individuals. We can expect that those people will deliberately try to deceive us until the day that he sets all things right. They have clever tongues and they have quick wit, but they nevertheless follow a path to falsehood and we have to be aware of these clever forgeries that we see in our lives. But our God is the God of truth 
and power and for every shortcoming or lie or distraction he is eternally enough to overcome them both in our own lives and in our church he counters and crushes the lies of the enemy at every turn whether they are lies that we speak to ourselves about our own value and our own worth whether they are lies that they speak to us, that the enemy speaks to us about our destroyed family that can never be made whole again, whether they are lies that he speaks to us about anything else, our God is the God of truth and redemption. And his voice is clear. His voice is eternally able to overcome. He builds and nourishes the people of his church every day. And our God is infinitely more than enough. And he will correct, and he will rebuke, and he will discipline, and he will train those that he loves. He is patient, and he is kind. He is consistent, and he is pure. He is all we need, and ever more than we can know. Because his church is enough for the whole world... It is through this church that he does his work. It is through his words to the churches in Revelation that we can know this. And I want to wrap up by by some things that we see in these churches. First of all, he reveals his face and his truth and his love through the churches in the daily exhibition of those who are saved by him. How does he reveal himself? Because Sharice is nice to somebody who doesn't deserve it who she could really be mean to because she's a nurse and she can hurt people if she wants to and it's called therapy in their world when tanya could correct someone who needs to have their nose rubbed in their mess but she shows the love of christ anyway when retha continues to take care of so many of us that she takes care of by organizing us when my wife maintains her home and her fidelity to me when jesse's a good student when when Matt and Ophelia buy lots and uh, property that doesn't have any value because they believe God has placed people that do have value, when Mignon raises her children to know the love of Jesus Christ, when Michael Coker is faithful and true to show up and serve every single day on Sunday morning, this is how God's face is shown in the world, through you, right? Through you and your intimate interaction with other human beings. Yes, you are critical to this. This is how God uses these vessels of clay that have an ignoble outside for noble purposes. God has identified each of us as an essential part of the body of Christ, and he reveals his church, his love through his church and the people in his church. Secondly, he redeems. He redeems because we cannot save ourselves. We can't. And he speaks to the churches about his work of redemption, not their work of redemption. In all cases, in both these seven churches and throughout the word of God, it indicates that we cannot save ourselves. We can't be individually or corporately worthy of acceptance into heaven. Because Jesus is the one that made us acceptable to God. He redeems us. He rescues the perishing. He erases our sin. He does the unthinkable for the undeserving. Thirdly, he retains us. God's love is not conditional. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad he doesn't just smack us and start over with someone else? When we disobey, when we wander... Aren't you glad it's not provisional on how good we behaved last week that he loves us? He retains us. He has saved us and he retains us. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. The Bible says that what he has in his hand, no one can snatch out of it. He's our good shepherd. He's our redeemer. He retains us. Fourthly, he revives us. He is continually encouraging and directing and calling us to return to our first love. He gives us the supernatural energy and guidance and direction that we need to fulfill our purpose. And we're just flat worn out and tired and too dumb to do it. He gives us all of those things that we need because he revives us. 
He doesn't call us to anything that he cannot do through us. And that revives our spirit with purpose and meaning. And finally, he remains constant and true. He is never changing. He is ever present. He is ever loving and ever powerful. He is the amen to himself. I just love that. This message is brought to you by the amen. Then it must be a good message. Even if I don't like what it says, it's a good message. It's from the one who says, so be it. The one who, when he opens the door, it cannot be closed. When he closes the door, it cannot be opened. The one who affirms the downtrodden. He is consistent and he remains. He is in all and through all and over all and for all. The purpose of these passages and of what I think are the intimate messages to each one of these churches is to instruct us today. The Bible is profitable for teaching, for training, for reproof, for correction, so that the man and woman of God will be adequate, have all that we need to do the work that he's given us. This is not some literary exercise or obscure prophetic passage. These are literally things that we can learn from. They direct us to our work to see the world set right in his name. To see our nation turned to the very one who allowed us the prosperity that we have. To see our state and our city genuinely thrive. To be a transformed church full of truly transformed individuals. All for the glory of God. Amen. Father, I thank you for this day. For letting us read somebody else's mail. These letters to these churches of these men and women who are just like us, imperfect humans saved by the perfect grace of an infinitely loving God. And we appreciate the instruction and the training and the revelation that we receive when we pay attention to your word. I know I do for sure. We pray that we will continue to be the expression of your love as we interact with individuals and groups today and tomorrow and the days and weeks and months to follow. It is in your name we give you all the glory. Amen. I will not have a time of invitation today, but the time for invitation is any time God's working in your life. You can respond. So you should. Um, I, I think about an invitation, and almost every time I do, I think about the time that Shariah told me she became a Christian. And I asked her when she did it, and she said, when I was in my bed upstairs before I went to sleep last night. I think that is absolutely beautiful. Right? God speaking to my little girl in her heart, before she goes to sleep at night? How much better <laughs> for me than me saying something to her is her heavenly father speaking that truth to her individually. And God does that for each of us, right? If we listen, he speaks to us. I hope you have a great week. Um, I'm going to uh, beg off of house church tonight. I'm taking my wife to the airport. She's a, by the way, she's abandoning me and the children for four days. They just want you to know. Do you feel sad? Again? Again, again. It's, it's so sad. I'm so sad. Uh, so if you want to like send pizza or something. I, I Honestly, just as an aside, I'm offended by my children. When mom is gone for like an hour, they get like, so when's mom coming back? Like, well, you're not going to die. I'm like, you'll be fine. And they're like, is there any food in the house? Yes, there's food in the house. We're going to eat. And they begin to like, wander through the house foraging as if there wasn't food. So tonight we will not have house church as we'll be foraging for food after I drop her off at the airport. And, and um, 
getting ready for our Easter celebration. This Wednesday night is a great time to be a part of the church at Western Hills if you want to be a part of what we've got going on there. But if not, there are lots of great places you can go on Wednesday nights, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, we will have Easter sunrise service next week, I think 6.30, is that what we said? 6.30, the sun comes up about 6.42, I think is what it is, or something like that on that morning. We'll be situated well. Friday, look for time uh, to go pass out some flyers to invite people from the neighborhood. I hope our neighbors come out to see why there's a tent set up on the property. And we can meet people and let them know that we are there to serve and to love in the name of Jesus. And uh, with the hands and feet of the Cancio family. They decided they couldn't do it by themselves. So they're going to have, you said 12 kids now? Is that what you said? Uh, one. Well, oh, one. Just one. One now. One now. Did you see her face? By the way, a few weeks ago when I called her up to wish her a happy birthday, she thought I was going to spill the beans that morning. And if you look back at the video, she looks mortified that, <laughs> that I'm going to announce it to everyone. It was really a lot of fun for me. Any other announcements this morning? All right. Have a great day. We will see you later on. Hi, Mama.